Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, we will be taking all of the questions at the end of the presentation, but please send them in through your Q&A chat box at any time during the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Craig, would you like to take it away? Yes, thank you, Marissa. Um, hi, this is Greg Durkers. I'm with the State Energy Program in the Office of Weatherization Intergovernmental Programs. I'm going to kick us off here um, and I uh, want to just say a few notes for those who've joined us and, and um, that we really appreciate you joining. Uh, we know there are a lot of pressing priorities uh, in your state um, and, and our, our thoughts are certainly with you and we hope that you and your family or friends are, are safe. Um, so thank you again. I'd like to just give you a few minutes here of context, uh, maybe a minute, um, and then I'll I'll turn to, to our speakers uh, and experts. And so the webinar, this webinar is uh, co-hosted um, by WIP and the Building Technologies Office. Um, uh, and it's really dedicated to state energy offices. Um, and the focus is on technology validation and how your states can partner with uh, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy to validate technologies that are uh, near commercial ready. Um, so we, we I first want to thank uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy Efficiency, Alex Fitzsimmons, for joining. I want to thank him for his leadership in advancing uh, the development of energy and cost saving technologies generally. Um, and we'll, we'll hear from Alex in just a minute. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, NASIO, David Terry, um, and others at NASIO for helping to convene the states um, for, for this call and for previous calls we, we, we've had as well. Um, before turning to Alex, um, just remind everyone again that we're really looking to um, identify some opportunities to enhance our field validation work, uh, which is run through the Building Technologies Office um, and, and Amy Harone, you know, and, and her team. Uh, and so we'll, we'll hear from Amy as well today. And uh, today's webinar is really the third um, to talk about the EER, EERE supported technologies in need of validation sites. Uh, the first two covered a building energy management system for smaller buildings uh, of less than 50,000 square feet and, and as well as thin film windows, both uh, a significant energy savings potential. Um, and so today's, um, as you see on the slide here, um, today's call is going to focus on a non-invasive spray foam insulation system. Um, you know, if you do want to hear about previous technologies, um, there's a link in the slides which will be sent out after this call that will have a recording of the previous call as well. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll hear in a bit as well from Doug Lamb uh, with Building Energy Strategies about the, uh, the spray foam insulation system. Uh, and um, at the end, we'll also mention, uh, Amy will mention a new funding opportunity uh, for her office. Um, so now I'd like to turn to uh, Alex Fitzsimmons um, for some opening remarks and, and um, and then we'll hear uh, similar, similarly from David Terry, Executive Director of NASIO. Um, uh, so Alex, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Greg. And uh, hello and welcome to everyone. I, I hope everyone is uh, well and staying safe during this, during this time. I appreciate all of the state energy offices uh, for joining today under these, um, under these circumstances to learn more about what I think is a, a, an important priority is opportunities uh, for partnering with you on technology field validation. So as we know, these are certainly challenging times and you all in the states are on the front line. And we know that many of you are being called to um, uh, assist with uh, operation centers to fulfill ESF-12 functions. We know you're providing, you're continuing to provide services to your constituents, all while keeping your family safe. You're working, you're working with your governors how to maintain critical operations, uh, mission critical facilities. So we, we thank you especially for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us in light of everything going on with the, uh, the, the worldwide COVID pandemic. So we really appreciate all of your extraordinary efforts and um, the purpose, as Greg mentioned, of today's webinar is to talk about technology field validation. And 
what we mean when we say that is that the testing of near commercial ready technologies in the real world. So these are technologies, many of which DOE has been working on for years and years that have progressed along the TRL levels that are, uh, that are almost ready for prime time. And this is something that, that EERE and DOE has, has done in the past. And for example, you look at the, the Building Technologies Office, um, they regularly fund uh, testing for various energy saving technologies uh, to collect data, for example, on uh, real world performance and verify the operational data, the field tested data versus what's uh, collected in the laboratory. And so last year, I asked uh, the Energy Efficiency Technology Office Director, so that's the weatherization program, the Federal Energy Management Program, the Building Technologies Office, and the Advanced Manufacturing Office. I asked them all to collaborate on an effort to enhance uh, technology validation opportunities in the energy efficiency space, uh, particularly with our public sector partners, and that includes state energy offices, local governments, and federal facilities. And so the offices got together, they, they, and we all came up with a plan. And uh, in the short term, at least, we've identified uh, three technologies that we believe are most ready for near-term validation testing. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but these are three technologies that we think are both ready and that we have seen a stakeholder appetite for. So I'll cover those briefly. One of those technologies is a building energy management system that is suitable for smaller office buildings in the range of 50,000 to 100,000 square feet, which we see as a, an, an underserved market. And so it may be relevant to many of, uh, to, to many of you in the states who have uh, these sorts of facilities. So this technology, this, this energy management uh, system is a, a low cost, it is cloud-based, it is an open architecture a platform, a software platform that can uh, monitor but also control various building systems, including HVAC, lighting, plug loads. And uh, I, I understand there's been considerable interest from several state energy offices on a webinar that was held last month. Okay, so that's the first. A second technology that we've been, uh, that we've identified are uh, what's called triple, thin triple pane windows. So these are our windows that we've been uh, that that we, that we've been developing over a number of years. They use very thin glass. We're talking about 0.7 millimeters to increase both the uh, thermal performance and to lower the installation cost. And you know, as you could imagine, there's a potentially significant opportunity in both the commercial and the residential building sectors that could benefit from windows that have increased thermal performance and lower installation costs. So um, this was another technology that was discussed on the webinar last month. But for today's webinar, um, I'm, I'm happy to share some details about the, the third technology we've identified that we're going to go into much greater detail on. And this is a, uh, it's a new micro injection spray foam insulation system. That, that we think is an exciting opportunity to rapidly and cost effectively insulate uh, new buildings really with minimal disruption to, uh, to the occupants inside of the buildings, which is so critical. Um, we know that the sustainability, the long-term viability of many of these energy efficiency technologies that we're talking about depend on um, not just being able to save energy and improve performance, but ensuring that they don't negatively impact the comfort and productivity of building occupants. Because if they do, then they're not going to be deployed. People will not tolerate it. Because at the end of the day, our job is to improve people's lives, make people's lives better. And so we're excited about the progress that this particular technology has made. We've looked at early tests in uh, multifamily buildings, which indicate that uh, you can take a two-person crew and they can retrofit 
four of these units per day, and uh, that doing so, retrofitting these units can reduce HVAC run time by at least 25%. And that's just the initial testing. We could uh, further validate this technology by partnering with you in the field to the extent that, that you're interested in doing so. So as I mentioned, I asked the, uh, the energy efficiency sector program offices that I oversee to work together to enhance collaboration within EERE, uh, across our programs, and with, in partnership with the state energy offices. Uh, to to ensure that that your state have necessary support from the department to the extent you're amenable to it to conduct field tests that align with the mission and business needs of your particular state. So I'm really excited because I, I think that together we can help uh, speed up the market adoption of many of these energy saving and hopefully comfort enhancing technologies that improve energy affordability, efficiency, potentially even energy resiliency in some, in some key aspects, and all of which are key priorities uh, for, for our office. So uh, with that, I'd now like to turn it over to David Terry, who, as you all know, is the uh, the commander in chief of the National Association of State Energy Officials, NASIO, for a few remarks. So thank you all for the opportunity uh, to collaborate with you, and I'm really looking forward uh, to today's discussion. So David, over to you. Thank you. Thanks. That thanks. That's a, a terrific uh, introduction to uh, to these technologies and the efforts you're leading, Deputy Assistant Secretary Fitzsimmons, and and a quick thank you also for your bringing focus to this issue and to uh, both the Building Technology Office and the Weather Station Program Program Office Directors David Nimso and Anna Garcia, and especially Greg Durkers of the State Energy Program, uh, who's on the line and has been a great help to the states and to uh, and, and in this area. I think bringing focus to technology opportunities such as the microinjection foam uh, discussion today is important to, to move, you know, technology advancement ideas and research into practice, and that's what it's all about. And, you know, on a related note, NASU has been working with uh, a couple dozen state energy offices on a report that will be released in a couple of weeks on models of state energy innovation and economic development. And it, the report is about uh, things like field testing and validation efforts to, to speed uh, uh, the movement of technologies to the market, uh, much as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Fitzsimmons just discussed, and working with universities and the energy offices and DOE offices. So it's this is a, a really an initiative that um, I personally have a lot of interest in and is near and dear to my heart. And, and just a, a really big thank you to DOE, uh, but especially the states for joining the call today. I know um, I'm getting dozens of emails every day about uh, the kind of challenges that uh, Alex alluded to. Uh, with COVID-19 that you're all dealing with. And so uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I will uh, uh, leave it there for brevity so that we can uh, get on to the good, uh, the good bit, uh, if you will, with our experts. Greg? Thank you, David. Um, so the next, uh, Marissa, if you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, Amy Harone with the Building Technology Office, if you wanna, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thanks. So, hi, I'm Amy Harone with the Building Technologies Office. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview. Uh, we heard a, a lot about what field validation is meant to do and why we do it um, from Alex and David already. So, thanks both of you. Um, these particular validations are um, with technologies that are developed with um, DOE funding um, through the national labs through funding opportunity announcements and are ready to be in buildings and to test and develop data, um, objectively collected data and evaluated data to prove out the performance of these technologies and, and their energy savings, the comfort implications, the cost, um, and a variety of other factors that are developed as you develop the field validation test sites. Um, so we, uh, from the DOE standpoint, will help with um, the installation and monitoring of the technical performance um, through objective um, data collection and evaluation, as I mentioned. Um, and at the end, we will produce a study, a case study, and also a technical report on the performance of those technologies that can be circulated broadly to all of you, even if you decide not to work with us on um, hosting the validation. Marissa, you can go to the next slide. 
Um, oh, and I will just remind you that questions are welcome. You can type them into the questions box um, on your webinar pane to the side or however you have it set up. Um, and we'll be, we'll be tackling all of those at the end. Um, so I mentioned that the objectives of validation are really to um, evaluate, so we monitor, we collect data, we evaluate that data, and then we um, produce a report. So we're going to verify the energy reduction, we're going to verify the cost savings from utility maintenance, um, how, whatever other cost savings may be applicable. We're going to look at peak demand reduction so that we can understand the flexibility benefits of these technologies. And of course, we're going to make sure that occupants aren't affected. So um, that's, the, that's the, the kind of bread and butter of what we're doing with validation. And then once we've done that in one building or two buildings or however many buildings we design the experiment to include, um, we can also investigate how those data apply across a broad spectrum of building types in different climate zones, so different states and different um, types of uh, weather. So we can do that with um, simulation, we can do that with further lab testing, um, and we can apply what we've learned more broadly to understand implications for different building, buildings and um, different building types and different building operation scenarios. Uh, and I think some of the best information that we get through these validations in real buildings is about um, maintenance and ease of use and the ability of operators um, to actually achieve the energy savings that we've seen maybe through previous pilot testing in a laboratory where the conditions are more controlled. So those are some of the really great benefits of field validation and I think um, if you take a look at some of the examples that we have towards the end here, you'll see some of the good results that we've seen so far. Next slide, Marissa. Thank you. Um, so Alex talked about this a lot already. Um, we are working together collaboratively across all of the EE program offices um, in order to support a broad, diverse um, portfolio of validation sites. And today we're gonna to talk to you about this particular technology that might be hosted in state sites. Or if you have um, constituents or other building owners that you're partnering with, um, with them. So um, next slide, Marissa, I think we've talked about this plenty, thank you. Um, so here's how it's going to work. Um, you're gonna hear about the technology and you can go back to the other webinar and hear more about the other two technologies that we are focused on right now. Um, if you find that the site characteristics that we're looking for, the um, other benefits like comfort are applicable across your portfolio or with partners that you're working with, you can let us know. And we will work with you to make sure that that's the case and that the product is going to work for verification purposes. So there are things that we're, we're going to want to see, um, for example, with this um, microinjection um, spray foam, we really want a certain envelope composition. So those are the things that we're going to be looking for as we sort of dive deeper into what the site needs to look like. Um, and we also have lab objective lab experts that will come in and do the evaluation with us. So um, in this case, um, it will be Oak Ridge National Laboratory um, who will be collecting data, instrumenting, modeling, and doing the evaluation, producing the report. Next slide, Marissa. So this is uh, a schedule. <laughs> um, obviously, there are things that uh, that are limiting uh, us in uh, our ability to complete implement the schedule as proposed. So, for example, right now a lot of buildings are closed. Um, we can't access the buildings in order to install the technologies. And even if we could, there aren't as many occupants, and the operations are are not normal. So. We're gonna look at how the schedule can play out depending on how things you know, progress with um, COVID-19. Um, that said, there is a lot of work that can be done without getting into buildings and without looking at the load profiles of buildings right now, if you have good baseline data, for example. Um, also in identifying what host sites are the ideal host sites to do this validation. So 
while the schedule is hopeful, um, there are things that we can do right now to help us really hit the gas when we can, when the, when the time is right. And I mentioned earlier that there, there's, there's a good case study of a previous validation that we've completed. Um, that link is right here, and it will be in the slides when you receive them, if you haven't already. Um, so hopefully, um, we'll be working on site selection through the summer. Um, we'll be doing the installation in the fall, and then we're gonna look across uh, a couple different seasons for the spray foam technology that we're talking about today, so uh, about a year, and you can imagine that you know the data is going to be different depending whether it's winter or summer and what climate zone we're in and what building type. So, um, and it, as I mentioned, if you have questions about that in particular, please enter them into the question box. Uh, next slide, Marissa. And this is a slide that Greg is going to talk about. So, Greg, right back at you. Thank you, Amy. Um, I, I think uh, this is. Probably, I think this slide speaks for itself, and, and I want to get to our our experts. Um, but I wanted to make the point here that uh, you know the partnership benefits um, are are really are worth you know touching on. You know, this is really, as I think Amy, um, you know, who's been a wonderful collaborator with with WIP and Amy and and, and Eric Worling, who we'll hear from in a minute, have been wonderful collaborators and. That's been um, a nice part of this for DOE, but the, the benefits of energy office participation, as Amy outlined, really is you'll, you'll get um, assistance from DOE and potentially labs, and, and the opportunity to be part of a um, you know uh, supported you know a visible DOE demonstration project, and, and really gain some insights into um, you know what your how your buildings can um, benefit from some near commercial ready technologies, as Alex mentioned. So I mean. Um, I want to dwell on this slide. I want to move on to our speaker. So let's turn now to uh, Marissa. If you can go to the next slide, um, uh, Doug. Um, if you want to uh, go ahead, Doug. Uh, as I mentioned, is with Building Envelope Materials, um, and he's going to he's going to uh, talk a bit more about the uh, insulation technology. So okay. Well, thank there. you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for those terrific introductions. Uh, this is Doug Lamb with Building Envelope Materials, and I'm going to talk about a new technology for minimally invasive retrofit insulation. Uh, this was a technology that we developed over the past four or five years. Uh, it was sort of led by my company, but we worked with Certainty and a, um, a really large grant from the Department of Energy. Uh, and the original problem that we set out to solve was uh, if you've seen traditional deep energy retrofits of buildings, uh, essentially what they do is they tear off the siding and they put foam on the outside of the building and reset windows, reset E's. Um, it's a very invasive process and very expensive and it works well, um, but it's not widely practiced just because of the cost. So what we were initially setting out to do was figure out how could we get benefits like that, almost the same as that, without going through this terribly invasive process. And we really were focused initially on single family homes. We have since broadened, still interested in single family homes. Uh, what we're discovering is that buildings that, that are dominated by walls, in other words, large, uh, taller buildings, are likely to see the biggest benefits just because we're doing this in walls and um, um, a lot of the energy loss in these taller buildings is through the walls. So, so we're working both on single family residential and on larger commercial buildings. Uh, next slide, please. So an overview, what this technology is, is that we're, we're essentially, it, it's really kind of dead simple in concept. We're really just drilling tiny holes in the wall, quarter inch holes, and we're injecting a material that's very similar to spray foam. It's not exactly the same. It's a closed cell polyurethane foam. It has a very high R value of R six and a half per inch. Um, it's a little bit different in that we use a uh, slower or actually less catalyst and, le and a different blowing agent. And essentially what those two things do is they allow us to fill the wall without blowing out the drywall. So if you put regular spray foam into the wall, 
uh, it would expand rapidly, it would heat up quite a bit, and it would likely um, blow out the walls. So this is a, a material that's it's actually been around longer than spray foam. Uh, we've just adopted it for use in, uh, in buildings. Um, so that's the, the basic concept. The, the other really critical part of this is that we have something that we call the talking rig. And the talking rig is a dispensing device that gives uh, audio information to the uh, technician who's doing the injection. And what's really nice about the talking rig is when you're actually doing the injection, um, people in the past have used displays, but when you're moving around in a building, it's very hard to, to see a display. So the talking rig provides audio uh, instruction so that the technician doesn't have to look at anything uh, like a display in order to do the injection. Um, so it, it, the talking rig really does two things. One is that it counts off the volumes of material that are being injected. Um, and that's important for making sure that we fill the cavities appropriately. But the second thing that it does, which is really, really critical, is that it ensures the quality of the material. So when you spray foam, in regular spray foam, uh, you're spraying into an open cavity, and you can look at the material, and you can pretty much tell whether it's good quality or bad quality just by looking at it and, and touching it. But when you're injecting into a wall, you really have no way of knowing whether the material is good quality or not, and that's obviously critically important. So, so this uh, talking rig monitors the two components that mix together and react when they go into the wall uh, to make sure that the quality of the material is good. As far as the benefits go, um, you can see in the lower right there a picture of the, what a hole looks like uh, that we drill in the wall. In the hole in the wall, um, those. Holes we typically just cover with some lightweight spackle. It takes maybe 30 seconds or so to cover that hole, and then they can be painted with touch up paint, or in some cases, if the wall is white, we actually just leave it and you can barely even see that there's a hole in the wall. Um, second, critically important benefit is that this technology works equally well in empty cavities and also in cavities that have fiberglass insulation in them. So the reason that's so important is that somewhere around 80% of existing of the existing building stock has fiberglass insulation. And uh, the ability to inject into that fiberglass without creating voids in the foam, in other words, where the foam kind of would hang up in the fiberglass, uh, is something that took us quite a while to develop. Um, and we've really got it down to the point now where we almost never get a void uh, when we're injecting the wall. Um, third critical benefit is that we can validate not only the quality of the material that goes into the wall, but we can also validate uh, that there are no voids. We use an infrared camera to actually look at the material behind the wall. So the, 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 this is a two component system and when the two components come together, they mix and they heat up. And when they heat up, we can see them. Uh, very clearly with an infrared camera. And if there was a void, uh, we could go back and drill a hole and, and fill the void. I would say based on having done about maybe 8,000 cavities at this point, we might have had voids in um, maybe 1% of those at the most where we had to go back and, and fill. So the voids are very, very, very unusual. Um, and uh, and then the last thing is, if you if you were to talk to contractors, this isn't so much of a an issue for building owners, but if you talk to contractors about doing this, the biggest concern that they've had is blowing out the wall. In other words, if you inject the material and it overexpands and it pushes um, uh, pushes the drywall out or deforms the drywall, uh, we call that a blowout. And without getting into a lot of detail, we have a process. So that we um, we basically never blow out walls. Um, we've literally never blown out a wall in all the different cavities that we've done. Next slide, please. So the um, the primary applications uh, that we're looking at, as I mentioned, we we like uh, big buildings. 
Um, we are working right now on brick veneer multifamily buildings with the Boston Housing Authority. So we're looking at, uh, depending on what happens with this current crisis, uh, doing somewhere around a thousand apartment units uh, this year um, in three different large buildings. So that's a brick veneer multifamily or any sort of brick veneer or masonry veneer uh, building are, those are all excellent applications for us. Uh, of course, under insulated single family, that's where we started. That's a, a very well known proven process. Uh, shallow cavities. A very interesting application. We've we've done a few shallow cavity jobs. It, they work great. Uh, shallow cavities you typically find in uh, row houses, um, typically in the Mid Atlantic area where there's masonry and then strapping over the masonry or uh, concrete block. There will typically be a cavity that's about an inch deep, and it's usually empty, and we can uh, easily fill those. Um, and and then uh, historic buildings we have not my company has not done a lot of historic buildings at this point um, but historic buildings have been done and the guggenheim museum is the most famous example so there was a contractor early on who had a very invasive process for injecting foam uh, into cavities and uh, he had actually filled the uh, the guggenheim museum so historic buildings where you can't change the exterior are great applications. And then of course, older office buildings. And those are uh, constructed very much like the multifamily that we're specialized in right now. Next slide, please. So as far as uh, the, the, the really big benefit, which is you know, how much energy are we actually saving? Uh, we we got a grant from the state of Massachusetts to inject a, uh, a multifamily in Providence, Rhode Island. And what we did is we injected uh, four units and we monitored eight units. And what we were monitoring was the HVAC runtime in all of those units over the course of a winter. Um, and we have uh, we have a lot of detailed information about this about how we actually did the measurements and. Um, uh, where the sensors were and all that sort of thing. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to send that out. But the the bottom line on this is that when the temperature was below about 50 degrees, what we saw was a 25% reduction in the HVAC runtime. And as the temperature uh, went down to uh, lower temperatures, we saw that reduction go all the way up to about 35% reduction in HVAC runtime. So these were really terrific um, results. It's one case study, it's not proof, but uh, it was certainly encouraging. Um, the cost to do this is somewhere around five to six dollars a square foot in a building that already has fiberglass insulation in it. Um, we can, with a one, sorry, with a two-person crew, we can do about four uh, apartments per day. With a three-person crew, we can do about six apartments per day. So we, we can move through the, a building like this. This was an 88-unit building uh, very, very quickly. Um, uh, and and uh, we don't require that the residents stay out overnight. So they can come back uh, two to four hours after we're done. Uh, so we don't even need to get hotel rooms for people or, or do anything like that. Next slide, please. For site criteria, um, you know, I've, I've mentioned brick masonry near is, is great. Uh, any sort of under insulated fiberglass filled cavity uh, is good. There's, there's virtually uh, no fiberglass insulated cavity. Uh, that we can't do. Um, shallow cavities I mentioned are also really good. For, as far as HVAC goes, uh, we would prefer electric. That's certainly not required. Uh, the only real reason for electric is that the savings are gonna be, the dollar savings are gonna be a lot greater. Um, but the uh, runtime reductions would be pretty much the same no matter what the, uh, the energy, the fuel source is. 
Uh, we prefer not to have single pane windows in the building. The reason for that is that if there are single pane windows, a lot of the energy is going to be escaping through the windows, no matter what we do for the wall. Um, and then uh, poorly insulated buildings or buildings that have a relatively high energy use intensity would of course show uh, much better results. So those would be of great interest to us. Uh, climate zones four plus um, would be ideal. And then um, data access, we can get into those details, but we would be installing sensors. Uh, we'd like to be able to do sub metering. Um, we would definitely need utility bills, uh, ideally for about two or more years. Um, and then, of course, the uh, the building owner would be willing to uh, must would have to be willing to to allow us in and do this work. And I think that's it. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, thanks so much, Doug. You can go to the next slide. Um, so, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and take this one, unless you would like to. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, all right, so what we are doing today is looking for technolo uh, technology validation host sites. Um, so thank you all again for joining, and we'd love to hear back from you. There's contact information here. We haven't yet heard from Eric um, Worling, who is the um, Building America Program Manager from the Residential Buildings Program in the Building Technologies Office. Um, Eric, did you have anything to add to Doug's presentation or just want to say hi? Um, no, just supporting. I mean, we, we've had um, a great discussion so far with, uh, you know, a pretty broad uh, explanation of all the issues around field validation. And then we and then we uh, heard from Doug getting into the specific details of this technology. So I don't really have anything to add other than to uh, just say how exciting of, a, of an opportunity this is to be able to work with state offices, uh, you know, energy offices, uh, if possible to identify buildings where we can take an exciting new technology like this micro uh, injection uh, insulation system for retrofitting buildings. We know retrofitting buildings has been a really difficult thing, to, um, but we're focusing a lot of attention on that with our investment portfolio. And I'm, I'm really uh, bullish on this particular technology. We've uh, started funding it about three years ago. Is that right, Doug? I think is when yeah. we uh, initially yeah. got your proposal. So uh, it's really exciting to see his project moving along um, pretty close to completion of the initial bit of work. And this is really just an opportunity to take it further through field validations along the lines of what Alex and everybody else on the call has introduced. So I guess that's all I have to add. Um, and uh, I guess we're close to the questions part, right? Yes, we are. Thank you so much. Um, so. Uh, just to continue on here. So you can reach out to Greg or Eric specifically if you are interested, have questions, want to learn more, and then um, we'll connect you with the technology experts. Um, and and we mentioned before there, we this is the third, I'm losing track of the number, um, but the, we've done, uh, uh, we did another webinar on building energy management systems and then film windows, the triple fins. Um, so you can go and check that out as well. Um, so keep those questions coming. I see several in the box. Thanks, all of you. Um, so uh, next slide, Marissa, and I think we'll jump into questions right away. Um, yeah, we'll just jump into questions, and I'll talk about this uh, when we wrap up. So um, how many demonstrations um, have been done so far, um, more than just the Providence, Rhode Island test? Thank you, Rodney, for sending that in. We've done probably 30 to 35 buildings. I have I don't have an exact somewhere in that range. Um, so we're 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 commercial. And those are primarily in homes, I I think, right? So we're looking for more of the commercial opportunity here. Yes, that's correct. Commercial and multifamily, great, thank you. Um, and then along those lines, um, are you said it's applicable to four plus climate zones, any application for lower than four climate zones? 
uh, you have to know your map pretty well for that one. <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's a good question. Um, you know, I, what I would say is that we really would do would want to do an energy model for any building that we're going to do, and there's certainly opportunities in in other climate zones for uh, energy savings. So we could just do an energy model um, and make a determination of you know what the benefit would be in any building. We're we're finding generally that climate zones four, five, and six uh, show the greatest benefit, but it's we really honestly we did one building down in florida um but other than that we honestly just haven't had a chance to do buildings in climate zones one two and three great good good news um how much training is required for the insulation installation and um, are there training opportunities associated with the validation the answer is Definitely, we can train people, and we're looking forward to training people. It takes, there, there, you know, in, on a two-person crew, you have a, uh, basically a laborer and an injection technician. The laborer, I can train in half an hour to an hour and a half, something like that. It's very simple work. Um, the technician, typically, that takes about a day before they're ready to go on their own without any supervision. In complicated buildings, it could be two days. Um, but it's, this is not terribly complicated. It's, uh, there's one small piece that is a little bit hard to figure out, but once you get through that, it's really dead simple. Yeah, if I could add to that, this is Eric from DOE. It's, um, it's really just a variation on the theme of uh, you know, spray foam insulation, which has got a well-established certification system, et cetera. So uh, the building envelope materials technology is really just a variation on that. And um, as hopefully you could tell from some of the early slides, some of the benefits are that the uh, Doug and his team have really thought through uh, how to help the technician to be able to do a job effectively and uh, that makes some of the, the training even more uh, potentially streamlinable because of the uh, you know smarter system for um, dispensing and monitoring the the, uh, the job. The talking rig, <laughs> I love the it. The talking um, rig really it right. provides. I should just mention that one thing about the talking rig that I didn't mention before is that it not only tells if you are off ratio if your material is not uh, exactly right for whatever reason the talking rig not only tells you that you're off ratio it tells you how to fix it also and there's a simple control valve and it just tells you turn it this way one turn turn it that way two turns etc so it's it's real the equipment itself is really really simple that's very cool. Um, okay, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little about health and safety. Um, there's a question here about ver vermiculite, um, which, uh, and, and in the last webinar, we did have a question about um, aerosolization, I think is the word. So yeah, so, so Doug and Eric both, could, could you talk a little bit about health and safety associated with this product? Yeah. Uh, I can. So there, there are really two pieces of this air quality question, and one has to do with exposure of workers, and one has to do with exposure of building occupants. Um, so we've had, in in collaboration with CertainTeed, who is our partner on this, uh, three rounds of air quality testing done right w while we're actually doing the injection. So in other words, sort of worst case scenario. And essentially what they find is that while we're injecting, um, they can't find any aerosolized particulate. So uh, they're, uh, as one report said, it's virtually non-existent. Um, so in theory, we don't even need to wear a respirator while we're doing this. We, we do wear face protection um, just to be ultra cautious, but in theory, we'd really, the workers really don't need to. Um, so that's for worker safety. For as far as building occupants go, what you're most concerned about is VOCs. 
uh, otherwise, you know, also called uh, off-gassing. And so in one of those three studies, we actually monitored VOCs until they couldn't be um, found anymore. And basically what we found is after four hours, there are virtually, um, I, I don't want to say no VOCs, but the VOCs are at a level that uh, is well below uh, any sort of uh, recommendations for VOC exposure uh, after four hours of injection. And after a day, they basically can't find any. So we have those reports if people are interested. Um, the study on VOCs is pretty extensive. I'm happy to send it out if you like. Um, and uh, the, the other study regarding particulates is much shorter. Um, that was done by uh, University of Massachusetts. So both of those are available uh, if people want them. No, this Great. is Eric. Um, I, I can add to the question or to the answer to specifically, I think, Amy, you said the question mentioned vermiculite. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And um, that's a, a very specific uh, uh, you know, health and safety issue with regards to buildings. Vermiculite is a is a sort of an ancient insulation system, meaning like 50 years or so old uh, since anybody's ever used or used it. It's still in old existing buildings, uh, mostly in attic situations. Although I do believe it it was used uh, for a short period of time in walls. Um, but the, there is some guidance on how to uh, handle. Mostly it is don't handle um, vermiculite and asbestos-containing materials. Um, one of the best sources that I'm aware of uh, is an EPA document called Healthy Indoor Environment Protocols for Home Energy Upgrades. And that document uh, is uh, pertinent to this kind of work. And mostly the guidance is to not disturb existing vermiculite if you find it while you're doing home energy improvements. And one of the things about uh, um, the insulation material that we're talking about here is that we, we don't actually have to disturb the insulation, we're encapsulating it um, and uh, not getting the asbestos uh, fibers to go airborne, which is what happens when you try to remove something like vermiculite and why we're not, why we recommend against it. So uh, I would say that if you follow the EPA uh, and other OSHA guidance about uh, handling um, vermiculite, uh, there's really no in, uh, additional risk whatsoever with regards to this particular foam insulation technology. Great, thank you so much, Eric. Um, so we'll go ahead and attach that VOC study, if you don't mind, um, Marissa, when we send out the slides to everyone. Um, and I was just going to say also that, you know, I, the, the envelope assembly is going to be something we're looking at when we are looking at site selection. Um, so that would be something we, we'd take into account when we are determining if it's a good site or not. And, and maybe it is. Maybe that's part of the study that we want to consider. So. Um, Okay, two more questions. Um, one, how many holes per area of wall, um, or what is the distance between injection points? Yeah, that's a good question. So we typically do three to four holes per cavity. So on, um, you know, and cavities are typically spaced 16 inches apart. So that's approximately the number of holes. Um, of course, under windows, it's you know, we're only doing one or maybe two holes under windows. Great. Um, and last question, and then we'll we'll wrap up and, and let you all get back to your work. Um, so is the rig, the talking rig um, or equipment, uh, commercially available, or is it sort of part of the whole system and it's kind of a package deal? Yeah, that's, that's uh, most likely what we're going to do is actually uh, um, commercialize this as a package deal rather than selling the individual components. So the business model long term is to basically license the technology 
Um, we may not even sell the talking rig. We may just make it available to people. Uh, it's not terribly expensive to develop these things. So, um, so there would probably be a, a license fee, and then we would just sell materials uh, as needed. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I just uh, remind everyone that you can contact Greg or Eric if you have other questions. Um, and we can follow up on those separately, or if you have a building that you think is a good candidate to do this uh, validation um, project. And then I am just going to close out really quick by mentioning um, an RFI, so request for information that we have um, within the building technologies released onto the street. We're looking for um, some feedback on this idea of connected communities and as it relates to a FOA that a funding opportunity announcement that we um, may be releasing at the um, end of this year. So hopefully you've had some time to read all of the text on the slide. And if you haven't, it, the slides will go out. But uh, Connected Community is a group of grid interactive efficient buildings with diverse, flexible end use equipment that can collectively work to maximize building and grid efficiency without compromising occupant, occupant needs and comfort. If that is something that you're working on or is along uh, some of the thinking that you've been doing, um, check out the, the RFI, check out the RFI anyway, of course, to see what's going on. Next slide, Marissa. Um, and it will be out for a good amount of time. Um, and you can respond and um, we'll be accepting those responses um, and incorporating them into our thinking. So um, that is the summary for that. And I would turn it back to Greg for any last words or thoughts about the webinar today. Thank you, Amy. Um, uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining um, Deputy Assistant Secretary Alex Fitzsimmons, first and foremost, but uh, uh, David Terry at NASIO um, and, and, and all of our speakers, um, uh, Doug and, and Eric and Amy and um, really appreciate everybody's uh, input to this and as you can tell we're excited about this um this is a, an area that um we've, we've really made a lot of exciting progress but we really want to to uh, work with you all directly as, as you've heard and so please do reach out to myself or eric or any of us and we'll um we'll we'll, we'll jump right on on the opportunity and, and we hope this is a um you know welcome distraction from uh you know, pressing matters that you're dealing with in your states um uh, so i don't know if anyone else has any any Final remarks, but uh, I think we can probably close it out and uh, appreciate everybody's time. Thanks so much. Okay. Have Thanks. a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.